So we have 22 indicator species for signs of the seasons, five calibration plant species, and one intertidal species, a rockweed species called Ascophyllum nodosum. We have many uh, plants that are found uh, throughout Maine and are abundant in their locations. Uh, we have uh, animals, including birds and amphibians and butterfly. So what do volunteer observers actually do for signs of the seasons? So the components of our program are to select a site or sites, your plants and animals found at those sites, make observations, record observations, and that's what we're gonna go over today, all of that, and then enter data online or via Nature's Notebook smartphone app, which we're going to cover tomorrow. So we'll start with what is a site? A site is the area in which you, you'll look for your animal species and the area which encompasses any plants that you plan to observe. And that's kind of the first step in getting started on observing phenologies to select at least one site to make the observations, though you may choose to observe at several sites. So when selecting sites, such as your yard or a nearby natural area, there are guidelines to follow. So which comes first, the site or the species? Well, this is really um, dependent on where you have the species that you want to observe and um, if that site is accessible and available to you. So I have actually four sites. I have three sites on my property, my backyard, my front yard, my side yard, and, uh, and then one um, site at my office in Waldeboro, which encompasses only one plant species that I look at there. So it really depends on what's available to you and, and what you're most comfortable in doing as far as number of sites and number of species that you want to look at. So site selection guidelines. Well, it's really important that convenience, that's number one, you will be visiting your sites regularly and often to collect phenology data. So it should be convenient and easily accessible. So for example, you may want to choose sites that you already visit frequently, such as your yard, a neighbor's woods or field, or a nearby natural area where you regularly hike on the weekend. So the best data, of course, are the data that actually get collected. So make it as easy for you and convenient as possible. A representative location, what is that? Well, we, all, we welcome all your observations, even if your site is unusual for your area, but we encourage people to select sites that are representative of the local environment when possible. So select a site in a relatively flat or gently sloping area. Avoid areas that are subject to drifting snow or funneled or channeled winds. And um, also to ideally the site should be neither excessively dry nor wet for your area. In forested areas, the site should be generally similar to the surrounding forest, reflecting the overall canopy composition and forest stature. So in observing wild plants, you want to avoid locations where plants are watered or fertilized. And if your site is unusual for your area, record the unusual characteristics in the comments section on your data sheet and later enter this information in Nature's Notebook online, which we'll go over. Um, uniform habitat. Um, so if you choose to observe in two adjacent but distinct habitats, please document them as separate sites. For example, a wetland um, adjacent to, to or surrounded by a dry, dry, drier grass, grassland or forest should be documented as a separate site from the grassland or forest. So in other words, habitat type is really uh, important if you can um, in include that. Appropriate size. Well, um, this is the extreme. Um, so on Nature's no Notebook, you uh, cannot have sites that are greater than 15 acres. A 15 acre site might, in, might be, as an example, a pond that you're uh, wanting to observe at, and it's a 30 acre pond. So you would split that into two sections. Um, I don't know of anybody really that has 15 acres as a site, but um, that's the extreme end of that. And then you might have, um, 
So you want to look at, for animal observations, you want to consider that um, your sight will be very small if you can't see or hear them. So in a forested area, it might be smaller than in a grassland area as on the left. Um, for plants, it could be, your site could be, you know, just a portion of your, of your yard or, um, or an area that is quite small, or it could be something that you can uh, walk through and see the different plants that you choose. So it could also be as, as small as the drip line on a pine tree, for example. So we hope that you'll select signs of the seasons indicator species list of plants and animals from that list. Um, and when selecting individual plants to observe, this is the ideal. Again, we welcome all observations. So avoiding plants that are closer than 20 feet to a road or a building and selecting plants that are not watered or fertilized if possible. Um, if observing more than one individual of same species, select plants that are not direct neighbors to each other. So there's a lot of frequently asked questions that are covered on um, the uh, website, Nature's Notebook, and we also have it in our field guide as well. So some of these include, may I observe plants and animals at the same site? Yes, that's absolutely the most accessible way to, um, to concentrate your area and your time. How many species should I observe? That's really uh, based on what you have at your location that you want to um, make observations. So that's up to you as well, time and space. How many individual plants? Again, it's really um, up to your individual situation. And how many sites? Well, as I pointed out earlier, um, I have four sites, but um, to start out, I had two. So I think that starting small is probably a great idea. Um, so that you'll continue and add as, you, uh, be, as you're more comfortable or as time allows. So how often should I observe? Well, early in the season, I think it's really important to be looking at your plants and observing your animals um, as frequent as you can, at least once a week, uh, because that's when things are really getting geared up and changing quickly. But it's really dependent also on your time frame and what you have available. So marking your site, this is kind of common sense. It's just whatever will work for you. Um, so flagging on stakes or rebar, uh, natural or, or human-made landmarks, and plants, you can you know, tie label flagging um, to individual trees, shrubs, or base of perennials. You can put plant, mar plant markers in the ground, which could be any number of things. Just basically what works for you to note where your plants and, um, are and what location they are and which plants they are. So uh, you want to, so how to observe. So we're gonna get into that now. Be sure that you have correctly identified your species. If you are unsure whether your identification is correct, you'll want to enter your observations on paper data sheets only. You want to uh, then send the digital image of species of the species or the phenophase to us. We're happy to help identify that and we have advisors to assist with that process if we can't. And then enter observations online only after you confirm what the species or the phenophase is that you're um, observing. So at each time you visit your site, you're going to um, you're going to observe the same individual plants. You may choose to observe more than one individual plant of a species at a site, um, but you'll do that uh, repeatedly every time that you visit that site. In the animals, we have a methodology for that, and it's kind of set in stone, and it's uh, that we look and listen for all the species on your list of animals and you choose a method for observing animals, it's chosen for you. <laughs> so it's stationary at a single point. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's walking a single line, a transect line uh, through your site. And it's for um, a three minute period of time. So, uh, and then there are incidental sightings. So there might be chance sightings while you're not specifically um, monitoring your, your site. Uh, but if you do find that at other times 
you can put that uh, under incidental sightings on your data sheet. And those can be included in your database. Every time you visit a site, you're going to complete a phenophase data sheet for each species that you observe at that site. Um, this is all um, different for the, um, the Nature's Notebook app on your cell phone. You don't have to uh, use a data sheet at all, but if you're using a data sheet and you're actually entering your data online in Nature's Notebook database, you want to complete a phenophase data sheet for each species that you observe at each site. You, the phenophase definitions in data sheets are different for different species. So you want to make sure that you observe and record the correct phenophase for each species by checking those uh, phenophase uh, definitions carefully. So your phenophase data sheets are uh, very, very simple to fill out. Um, so if the phenophase, if you note that, um, uh, that a, a bird is, doing, uh, is building a nest and has material in their beak, then you would put a Y for yes, if that, since that is a phenophase you're looking for is occurring, or no, if the phenophase is not occurring. If you are not certain whether you observe that phenophase, you want to uh, circle the, the, the question mark and you leave it blank if for any reason you did not look for the signs of that phenophase. So here's uh, our data sheet um, and each one of these uh, columns uh, represents a different time that you will go out to make observations. So you put your date and time. And for this, this is the American Robin and you're going to uh, look to see if you um, if you heard or you saw an active individual, and then you would put, say, say you saw two, uh, then you would put the two in the, um, the, where the line is for the number of individuals, and you would circle the Y. So you do the same for each one of these phenophases. Or did you see or hear them feeding? Did you, did you see or hear uh, fruit and seed consumption, insect consum consumption, calls or songs, singing males, mating, nest building, were there dead individuals, yes or no, how many, and uh, individuals at a feeding station, yes or no. Um, so that's the way you fill out that data sheet. So we're going to do an example um, of American Robin uh, looking at um, our, our two species that are our animal species, the monarch and the American robin. So this is an observation in my side yard, so-called, and on your site visit, you slowly walk along your transect for three minutes and you see one robin flying through the, through the site, one robin perched and singing. No monarch butterflies but you see an egg on a milkweed plant. So in that case, um, did you see or hear active individuals? Yes, we, we saw two. So that would be, um, you would put two that you saw and, and circle the Y. And you would do that for each um, one of these phenophases. And so that would be the way that we would fill out the data sheet for that example. And every time you make observations at a site, you also will complete a cover sheet for that site. So a cover sheet looks like this, and it includes reporting your contribution of time, which really is important. We, are, um, we work on a small budget, and we do get small grants for uh, the program. And so when we are able to let people know uh, how effective and what kind of contribution volunteers are making, um, it is a, it's a bonus for us. It's also something that Nature's Notebook um, and the National Phenology Network really um, needs as well. So time spent observing, uh, typically for me it's 15 or 20 minutes, so you would put 15 minutes. Uh, time spent in travel, five minutes. For me it would be one minute because I would be walking out my door. Um, and then time spent looking for animals will always be three and the W for walking, walking uh, three minutes. So is there snow on the ground? Well, more recently, we 
could uh, we could say yes, but not now. Um, percent of ground coverage, uh, we put that in if it exists. And is there snow in the canopy? So no for all of those. And any comments that you want to make. So we're gonna. I'm gonna move on to um, to Beth, and Beth is gonna take us through uh, making plant observations. So I wanted to run Esperanza, and I thought it would be helpful to run through an example using um, Forsythia um, as an example of a plant species, and Forsythia. Um, is very visible. It's a bright yellow flower that's one of the earliest that comes out, so probably most of you know it. Um, and these are, we're going to use some photos that I took uh, last year, kind of throughout the season, just to show you how it evolves um, through the season. Um, so I'll start by showing the, the plants um, and animals, each one, and you can print these out from the website. We'll, we'll go through how to do that next time if you want to use a paper data sheet. Um, but just be aware that it's the same process using the app and it's all of the same categories. It's a very user-friendly interface, but we're showing you on the data sheet just so you all um, can, can compare and, and understand how it works visually this way. Um, so the data sheet, again, it's a single column per visit to a site. And then with, for each site that you have in each site with a forsythia plant, you would go through this kind of the same process. Um, the data sheets are organized so that leaves uh, for the plants are always clustered at the top, the leaf phenophases. And again, a phenophase is just the name for each individual um, type of change that you're looking for. So breaking leaf buds, um, full size leaves, increasing when our leaves are coming out, increasing leaf size, color leaves, falling leaves. Um, in the middle section, we have flowers. Flowers are flower buds, open flowers are release of pollen. And then in the bottom section, there's a section for fruits. And all plants, um, even though we don't always think about it, they do have fruits because of course a fruit is anything that holds seeds. Um, so they look very different depending on what you're looking for. But um, a pine cone is a fruit, for example, for a pine tree. Um, and for Scythia plants have little tiny fruits that you might not have even noticed before because I never did before starting to do this program. Um, so then the section for fruits is at the bottom of the data sheet. Um, and so I am going to, um, as you go through your phenophases and you have, you might have questions if you haven't, sorry about that. I didn't realize if I used two fingers, it would automatically advance. Um, we have written up examples of the phenophase definitions for each of these species. And I'm just going to show you, this is an image of that, but I wanted to show you, um, here. Oops, stop share. And I wanted to show you, show you a different one on my computer. But maybe I will actually do it um, from the website instead. So that will be a little bit easier. So if I go to our indicator species, um, as we did last time, and I, I'm just going to show you where it is so you know. This is Forsythia, and then we'll look at the phenophase definitions for Forsythia. And um, so here we have the directions on what we're looking for. The leaves, um, breaking leaf buds, leaves, increasing leaf size, color leaves, and then the flowers. And these are all the definitions. So I'll just read, read the first one and then I have them in, in among my slides too. So we'll refer to these as we go forward. So when it asks you if you see flowers, um, what you're looking for is um, are flowers or flower buds. One or more fresh flowers or flower heads are visible on the plant. Flower heads include many small flowers that usually do not open all at once. Do not include wilted or dried flowers that remain on the plant or heads whose flowers have all wilted or dried. And then there's going to be a question about how many you're looking at on your plant. Um, so let's switch back to the photos that I have and I'll go through it with you. Okay. Oops, sorry, this is what I meant to do before. This is the rest of that page so that I can just scroll through it here. 
Thank you for your patience with our Okay, um, so this is that. And so um, say it's March 20th. Um, you go out to your yard and you are, want to look at your forsythia and this is what you see. Um, you see very tightly closed buds. Um, you're not sure whether or not they're flower or, or leaf buds. Um, so what you could do is click the question mark because you're not sure. But remember on Forsythia, um, and you'll, you'll know this as you observe your species through time, there's some plants um, that the flowers come out first like Forsythia and red maples, and there's some that the leaves come out first. And if you're a veteran Forsythia observer, um, you, would, you would assume that these are going to be flower buds, but you can tell for sure once they start to open. But for now it says here in the definition, do not include those that are tightly closed and not actively growing. So when we go out on March 20th in this particular time, we're going to click no for each one of those because there isn't anything happening yet. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this is because it's actually really important to do that initial observation before things start happening because the researchers who use the data are actually looking for these changes, the time at which it changes from not happening to happening. And so it's really great to have that first observation. So next, um, if we wanted to observe again in an, another little while, let's say it's April 12th, um, you can start to see, I think you can probably see my cursor a little bit here. Um, you can see these um, little yellow tips starting to, to poke out of each stem. And in that case, you would actually be able to say, yes, we're seeing flowers. And then you would make an estimate for your whole bush, or, or you can use a, a part of the bush if you want, if it's easier. Forsythia can be giant and can sprawl across a whole corner of your yard. And so what you can do is just select an individual part of your bush that you're going to say, this is my plant that I'm going to observe. And then you're going to make an estimation. And the categories, at first, they're just trying to get a sense for whether it's really um, just starting. Um, it's well through the way or it's mostly in that phase. And so, for example, with your flowers or flower buds, um, you might say there are, um, in the beginning, it asks for a number. You might see them in three to 10 parts on, areas on your plant. And that's what you would add on your data sheet. So again, um, just as an example, this phenophase for flowers or flower buds actually refers to both flowers and flower buds. It refers to these buds that are opening up and flowers. So you're going to click yes, depending on whether you see buds that are just opening or open flowers. But the next um, phase is for open flowers. And so you could click yes here and then also click yes or no for open flowers. And I'll show you an example. So those are both yes. Um, and so if we go back, it's, it's a couple days later, we're really starting to see this come out. And so here you're not going to change anything except the intensity. You might see 25% of your plant in, in that phase. And there's a way to show in a drop down menu on your app or on your data sheet, you would just write 25%. You see it's opening slowly through time in another couple days. And then here, April 18th was the first time I saw open flowers on mine. And you'll see the window in the background there. That's because these are branches that I had brought in to force inside, which is fun to do because they're cheery at this time of year. Um, but it's also really nice to be able to observe them up close. Um, for my real observations, I did go outside, but I wanted to be able to take these photos inside. So here I have open flowers. I had yes for my flowers or flower buds, but the next phase is open flowers. And so I see one or more open fresh flowers visible on the plant. Um, and again, flowers are considered open when the reproductive parts um, inside here of the flower are visible between or within unfolded flower petals. And so you wait till it's really open and you can see it. When it's still closed up like this one is, that would still be considered a bud. And then the percentage that you're gonna use is 5%, 5 to 24%, 25 to 49, 50 to 74, 75 to 94, and 95 or more. And that seems sort of subjective and it, and it is. You just kind of do your best to decide which um, one of those intensities to use. But the reason for that is so that the researchers who are using the data can compare one observation in one part of the state to another part of the state because you might have open flowers in two different places, but 
in one place they might be at 95% or more kind of peak flowering, whereas they're just starting to open in another part of the state. And so that those um, subtle differences are important, but really it's, you know, you just do the best you can um, to make your judgment, your own judgment call about which which percentage it's in. And any data like that that you include is, is better than not knowing, so it's helpful. Um, so here is an example of the 95% or more. All of these um, flowers are open now, as are almost all of them. Um, and this is great because you can start to see um, the difference because the leaf buds are going to be starting to come out on the very end of each branch and some places along the sides. Um, but you can start to see the difference between what the leaf buds and the flower buds look like. So now we're getting a few days later, you can really start to see the leaf buds come out. This is April 27th. So when you, the phenophase for leaf buds on your data sheet, it's actually up above where you had the flowers um, and it's okay to do them out of order. They just had to organize them some way, um, but they're not sequentially ordered on the data sheet itself. So breaking leaf bud definition is one or more breaking leaf buds are visible on the plant. A leaf bud's considered breaking once a green leaf tip is visible at the end of the bud, but before the first leaf from the bud has unfolded to expose the leaf stalk or petiole at the leaf base. And so you can see these buds are breaking, but again, they're not fully exposed um, to show the whole leaf yet. And so we haven't entered the leaves phase. So I will go to the next. Um, so here we are, May 5th, a few days later, um, and I've entered the leaf phase because I can see that there's, I'm seeing the petiole at the base of these leaves and um, these buds are no longer breaking. So I would, I would say at this point, I would say no for breaking leaf buds if there are no leaf buds breaking anywhere, but you can be in more than one phase at once. So you can have yes for breaking leaf buds, but you can also have a yes for leaves at the same time on your same plant. Just to be clear that it doesn't have to go sequentially one through the other. You, you would say yes for as many of the phases as you see. So with leaves, you have one or more live unfolded leaves visible on the plant and the leaf is considered unfolded once its entire length has emerged from breaking leaf bud stem node or growing stem tip so that the petiole is visible, as I said before. And it also just has a note here, do not include fully dried or dead leaves. So at the end of the season, you don't wanna say yes to leaves if they're all um, dried and dead. Again, we have the percentages. So then there's a phase called in leaf, increasing leaf size, which is um, probably one of the most confusing for people, um, but it's really just if when you're in the earlier part of the season, you can think of, um, maple leaves, for example, you get that nice soft texture, they're glossy, they're fresh, they're kind of new leaves. Um, and that phase is quite short. It exists on Forsythia too, but it's when the majority of leaves in the plant have not yet reached their full size and they're still growing larger. And do not include the new leaves that continue to emerge at the end of elongated stems throughout the growing season. So this is a short phase. It's just trying to get a sense for, has this plant just leafed out or are these mature leaves later in the season? And so after this phase is over, you would just simply say no. It's not, you would say yes for leaves, but you would say no for increasing leaf size because that phase will have passed. And again, the percentages for each phenophase. And then we, we move on to fruits. And so again, Forsythia is um, a little bit trickier than things like strawberries to observe fruits, but they do have um, a fruit, again, is going to emerge from wherever the flower was and they don't emerge from every flower site because they're not all, all pollinated. But if you get successful pollination, you'll get this little tiny um, seed head right in the middle of where the flower was. And through the season, it grows and it's sort of an oblong shape. Um, you'll get an oblong shape of that seed. Um, and so then I just wanted to go back to our, our data sheet. Um, once you, once we're getting through fruits, you would have to this, I don't have photos of these, but you'd have ripe fruits, recent fruit or seed drop or other phenophases, or in back up in the leaves in, in the fall, you would get a colored leaf phenophase and then falling leaves. And so that's really kind of the whole season of what you'd be looking for with the Forsythia as an example. And so um, I will, I can see, um, I can't see your chat questions at the moment, but I will go back to them in a second and we can flip back through these for clarification. 
Um, but I'll just finish out the slides that we have for now. So next time we'll be entering data into Nature's Notebook and kind of showing you how that works. Um, but I just want to give everybody a chance to ask questions now and Esperanza and I will do our best to answer them. So remember, citizen science is the only way these data can be collected in such large numbers and we really appreciate you joining us for this. Um, but I will um, go back through now and we can kind of ask clarification. That was a lot of detailed information about, about both the sites and the observation process. Yeah. And we're happy to kind of go back through the slides themselves and clarify. So, um, and while we're uh, waiting for your questions to be put into the chat box at the bottom of your screen, um, I just want to point out that I, I did send out uh, a copy of our field guide, and that has pretty much word for word every, everything about uh, the program and, uh, and is a good resource um, for you to go back to. And if, and if you have questions beyond this, of course, and beyond the guide, we're happy to answer them at any time. There's also, while we're waiting for questions, um, there's also a, uh, if you're gung-ho to get started, uh, <laughs> there is a, a video that some uh, Brandeis students put together on how to, uh, it goes step-by-step -step through how to, to put your observations online. So here's a question, there's a couple of questions. Um, why are neighboring plants not ideal for observation? Well, I mean, they, you don't want them uh, next to each other because you want to see if, they're, uh, if that, that area has, uh, has a, better, a better idea of the, the data rather than being exactly uh, in the same location. Might be a better answer to that, Beth. I think that's right. That's right. I, th I would just add that um, if you had a whole hedge of forsythia, for example, you'll get a better sense kind of of the the timing for the entire site. If you have selected individuals throughout the site rather than in one location, but it's it's absolutely fine to just select one single individual um, from one location also, especially if you only had one. But for example, in, in my yard, I have a forsythia bush in my front yard and in my backyard. And so they do, the timing changes a little bit because one of them is more shaded. And so on average, you get a better sense for the timing on average. So good question coming up. Um, how do you recommend we share this information with roommates, community members, et cetera, that may be interested in helping group observations versus this workshop, et cetera? Well, we, we really welcome um, group observations. We welcome uh, sharing this information. There's a lot of information online as well. And uh, happy to put people into our mailing list for updated information newsletters, et cetera. As far as uh, group observations, um, it, that's a, there's a lot of detail that might go into that, or it might be as simple as people making their observations and, and setting up their own, um, if they're, it depends on the site, if it's the same site and you want to, uh, you know, one person uh, does observations one day and another person another day, that's a different situation than, um, than a, a, a group that wants to have one location that they put their data in rather than individuals. Um, so we can, we can talk more about that specifically. Um, yeah, and I'll just, what your situation is. And I would just add that we do have a number of groups that share sites. So both at the um, Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens and the Wells Estuarine Research Reserve are two examples of, of several where there's a really dedicated group of volunteers um, and there's a sing single individual who's kind of a point person for that site um, to help people find where their designated plants um, and animal sites are and then also to help enter the data online. And so people do it in different ways, but um, we'd be happy as Esperanza said to kind of help work through what makes the most sense. Okay. 
So Esperanza, I'll read the next question for you. Um, so a plant site is just one plant while an animal site is up to, to 15 acres, looking for some clarification on that. Okay, um, no, uh, so a plant site and an animal site can be the same site. Um, and in fact, it's uh, advantageous to be able to have it as, as a single site if your animals are found there. If there's a location like a pond that you wanna observe loons, then um, you might not have any plants at that location. So it would be just an animal based site. But um, uh, a plant site is, is you know, the, the number of plants that you have available that you want to observe and, uh, and, and collect data on in, in that site. I mean, it could be, you know, your, your backyard that has five, five plants that you want to observe. Um, you could also be observing robins and, um, and amphibians like toads, American toads there as well. So it is really, the, the site is, a, is the site and then whatever is found there that you want to observe, be it plant or animals is, uh, is great. So, and an animal so, site up to 15 acres is, um, you know, the 15 acres is, Say you have a pond and you and it's thirty acres. You want to divide it into two sites. Basically, it's 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 more to the point of being able to see and hear those animals. Yeah. So the next question is: Are sites that have human interference, such as active hay fields or mown lawns, et cetera, okay? Um, <clears throat> well. Um, if they're at the edges, like uh, if you have um, uh, plants along the edge or beyond that, but as far as uh, an active hay field, um, you, I don't, I don't think that would work very well. Uh, it just depends on what's uh, on the edges of that field, um, or you know, if there are birds or whatever that are that are accessing that that location, that's fine. And, and I would just add that, um, so I do have sites um, that I, you know, we mow our lawn, um, but I have a dandelion patch that I observe every year and I, they come up in the same spot. And so I have it marked with a little tent stake kind of pushed down flush to the ground. And so while that dandelion spot is active, I just mow around it. Um, and so I do, I, it is a moan site and I, and I do observe um, the birds there as well. Um, but, and so in that way it's okay, but it's good to just make a note in, as you set up your site in the database, which we'll go through next time about what types of use occurs in that site. And I would say that if you're observing birds in a hay field, that would be absolutely fine. But if you wanted to observe milkweed, for example, you would just need to leave a patch so that you can observe it go through its process. Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of detail tomorrow about, um, about uh, site selection um, and all the various things that go into that. Any other questions about um, selecting a site, um, choosing plants and animals, or how you make your observations? So here's another one, um, Esperanza. Is the data collected year round or just at the change of the season? Thank that. That's a great clarification. Yeah, that's a great question. So once your plants senesce, um, you're finished with the observations of plants. You could can, can continue looking at animals if you know if they if they're not migrating. Um, if they have migrated, then you're probably finished at that site. But um, so that's you know, it's, it's a, it's a pretty seasonal thing, um, a program, and you want to um, collect as much as you can while the seasons are changing. And then once it's finished, then um, you get a, a, hi a hiatus. <laughs> and so that, that I'll just add to that, that for the plants, once they senesce, you know, you, you would still want to get your no observation before you start to see changes. And right. so that does happen fairly early in the season. And then, you know, as a, of course, as our growing season is lengthening it, they go pretty far into the fall, but you don't have to observe every week, for example, through the summer when things are changing more slowly, except with things like beach rose where, you know, you're getting the fruit developing. 
there's kind of a slower season, but in the spring and the fall, things are happening more quickly and it's great to get in weekly observations if you can. That said, nobody has asked this specifically, but of course everybody here is a volunteer and you're allowed to go on vacation and not observe for a week or two. It's just on the whole, those are our recommendations and whatever you can do is data that wouldn't be collected otherwise. So it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that negative data point is really important. So at the beginning of the year, you know, you know, it's really great to collect when nothing is happening so you can actually get that change. And then one other point I'd like to make too is that, of course, loons are in coastal um, nearshore marine waters in the winter and robins are, you know, they do stay year round in some places. And we do have observers who observe year round. Um, and by all means, if you're excited to get out in the winter and you're out anyway, and you wanna make observations and you live, you know, near the coast. So we do have people who observe lo loons along the coast, um, the marine coast in the winter and then on lakes in the summer. Um, but for most of the plants that, there isn't a lot happening in the, most of the species, there isn't a lot happening in the winter. For this next question, um, we will be covering uh, the, the app, um, the Nature's Notebook app and uh, how to register the app. You know, it's either on, um, uh, for Android or for um, iPhones. So it's a pretty simple process. Um, and the, the other mm -hmm. question, go ahead. Okay, and our last question here um, right now, we still have some more time if anybody has any more, but have middle or high school students submitted data? Yes, we have a lot of middle and high school students submitting data. Um, we are very happy to have a lot of students involved in this program. Um, and some that have been, some teachers that have been um, working with their students for years and years with, uh, with signs of the season. So it's a great opportunity to get students outside you know, it's a lot of, there's a lot of information and uh, learning about data entry and, and data analysis. There's so many different things that you can do with this program. And we happen to have uh, resources for, for educators on our website. If you wanna take a look at those activities that we have online, we welcome middle and high school students. In elementary too, um, often the educators that we work with who work with younger students um, enter the data for them, but there are other activities that you can do with the students in the field for, as far as making the observations. Great, um, well, thank you so much. Are there any final questions before we wrap up? And feel free to send us questions. You have our email addresses, our contact information. So uh, at any time, we're happy to get any, uh, any questions uh, that come up after this. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. So thank you for your time. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great evening.